this to me is like the really fascinating material. We don't know what the answer is, but we're looking for patterns. I think we're looking at kind of a type of cosmic alchemy. The story slowly So a lot of people don't know that this technology actually exists. The possibilities here are pretty mind We can't just believe that it was the work of these lone troubled individuals. Alright guys, we're back on Conspiranormal. And we're back in the main studio with, my God, it's Rob. He I'm here. Die. I'm here. I'm back. I'm sorry, guys. I love you both. Yeah, the uh, rumors of your death were uh, greatly exaggerated. You squashed, you squashed those, though, right? Yes, we did. We replaced them like Paul. <laughs> <laughs> the new Rob. That's right. I'm the 2. new Rob. 0. I have different ears than the old Rob. And we've got Sir Fiel here with us yes i do not have to do producer duties tonight and i'm very happy about that and uh talking with no no more talk about russian cosmism <laughs> no and... more russian stuff <laughs> <laughs> well guys uh we're going straight into the guest and we have on the line mark stavish of the institute for hermetic studies i believe i got that right Sounds uh, good <laughs> welcome to conspiracy normal mark well, thank you very much. It's good to be here. I heard you on Where Did the Road Go about uh, about a month or so ago, and uh, we're good friends with Soraya, and I thought, you know, this would be an interesting topic because, honestly, I had never heard of the topic of egregores. Hopefully I'm saying that right, um, before I had listened to that interview. I had no idea what this was. Uh, but you did put out a kind of like a small book about it and a very interesting one. But the first question I kind of want to ask you is what are or what is hermetic studies? What does that mean as opposed to the occult? Is there a difference? Is there, is there a similarity? Well, hermetic studies would be the more practical or the more uh, authentic term. Occult means anything that's hidden, and there's a tendency to use occult or occultism as a kind of a blanket term for a lot of areas, usually around magic and astrology. Uh, but it's somewhat derogatory, uh, either rightly or wrongly so. Sure. Um, whereas hermetic studies really is more precise. Hermeticism, coming from Egypt. Uh, after the the Greek god Hermes, a uh, messenger of the gods, who was associated with uh, the Egyptian god Toth or Tohuti, and uh, so when we think of Hermeticism, we're thinking of the teachings of ancient Egypt, but also the ideas around ancient Egypt that were revived during the Renaissance. Many people don't understand it, but you know, we, we talk about the Renaissance. They think it was what the rebirth of ancient learning. What do they mean? The ancient learning of Greek and Rome, Greece and Rome. Well, that's only partially true. In fact, it was Greece and uh, Greek philosophy. But when they got bored with that really fast, uh, they they grabbed up the what they believed to be the teachings of ancient Egypt, uh, or the uh, the actual inspiration of many of the Greek philosophical teachings. So when we talk about Hermeticism, we're talking about a broad look of philosophy, uh, cosmology, uh, and spiritual practice. Many people just focus on the practice, of, of course, and the limited practices of magic and astrology and occasionally symbolism, like through the tarot or something. But uh, it's more than that. It's, it's a whole philosophical view, or views, actually. They're quite, there are several views that fall under the banner of Hermeticism. What brought you into interest into this? Oh, it's my family. I was brought up in this. My oh, great really? uncle was involved in nearly all of the uh, major orders of the early 20th century. And oh. his father, of course, was a Balka, a traditional German folk magician who learned it from his uncle over in Germany, in Eastern Europe. Uh -huh. in and, you know, it goes back even further. Posen was a hotbed of occultism, you know, they we use the term, but secret societies as well. I think the Fraternitatis Saturni had a uh, had a lodge there had a, at the same time. Of course, there would have been other lodges too, but that's the sensational one we say, you know. 
Yeah. So uh, that's the that's the, the line. And, and I've written a book on that. I wrote two of them. It's monographs uh, on Pennsylvania German folk magic and how it fits in. And and actually how German folk magic in Pennsylvania and certain other areas is actually the survival of that Renaissance worldview into the modern era. It's actually having a bit of a revival, which is interesting. And I'm sure that you're familiar with a book called, and now I'm going to, this is where I'll draw a blank, but uh, something long lost friend or something like that. Oh, of course. Long lost friend. That's, that's that's a standard that almost everyone goes to at some point in their, in their career. And then there's the six and seven books of Moses. Uh, Peterson did a wonderful edition of that. I think about, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago. And I, I did a nice jacket blurb for the back of it. He did a wonderful addition, Joseph Peterson. So the main question is, what is an egregore? What is it's it that uh, uh, there, there's a couple of different definitions as, as I kind of understand it. Sure. The, the most basic one is the social control mechanism. So what do we mean by that? It's a kind of collective awareness or collective consciousness of a group. And that's what a, a group does. A collective consciousness is a social control mechanism. We need to keep that in mind because they're not inseparable. They're, they're one and the same. But we don't always understand the effect it has on us unless we put it in those terms. So you have two types. You have the, the naturally forming egregore. And a bunch of guys get together and they form a gaming club. You know, well, they have a certain attitude, and certain views, certain things that, and they, that makes them stand out. Okay, you get a bunch of people who join, pick a club, you name it. Okay, whether it's the local Rotary, all the way to your Society for Creative Anachronism, all the way to, you know, your occult lodge or your knitting club, baking club, or the folks who support the local library. Okay, they all have a certain commonality and common uh, trends and ideas. But what happens is the more they get together, the more they become like one another, unconsciously. Mm -hmm. Well, when you do this consciously, when you purposely, with intention, will say, form a group, uh, that egregore is set from the beginning. You know what you're doing. Traditionally, uh, these egregores would be understood to have a spiritual entity of some kind at the, the other end. There's us down here on terra firma, and then there's something at the other end that we kind of have an agreement with. We take care of it, and it takes care of us. And you do make a connection in the book about to these beings, and, and of course you use the term egregore for, for those beings as well. So it can be either, this could be either R for an egregore being an actual spiritual entity are a concept. Yes, because the problem is, at what point does a concept become so overwhelming and so such a driving force that it, it begins to take on a life of its own? Right. I mean, you look at something like communism, which is clearly a social control mechanism, which is clearly about collectivism. You know? You know? That evil demon just won't die. No. Hmm. It just keeps finding ways to reincarnate. And so how is it? How does it that this idea become so powerful and so forceful that it just keeps managing to stay alive, you know, for a century now or so, despite all that's been proven about it? And then pick any idea like that on a smaller level. Uh, they just continue to exist and hang on. So is there maybe some kind of entity on the other end that's feeding off that idea that we don't see, that we don't know? Could be. I, I'm sure there is. I mean, I, why wouldn't there be? This, it's low-hanging fruit. You know, it's it's the feeding of opportunity. Um, so I would have no doubt about that. But that is a, a very good example of an egregore. You also talk about the the tulpa concept in the book as well. Uh, how is the tulpa concept similar to this idea? And is there are there differences? 
Yeah, that's that's the, the one people don't uh, get hung up on. They they trip up on that. You know, all egregores are thought forms, but not all thought forms are egregores. Okay. Okay. So, just because I create a thought form, whether it's to make a jolly monk that turns on me, takes on a life of its own, and turns on me, like uh, Alexander David Neal supposedly did or a thought form to get a better job or a new house or, you know, win the lottery, those aren't necessarily egregores. Okay. And that's what needs to be understood because they don't really reach out beyond the person. See, an egregore is a social control mechanism. It's a group thing. It involves a group of people, whether it's a small group of a, you know, a Wiccan circle or a knitting circle, you know, all the way up to countries and to some degree the world. It reminds me of like uh, the concepts of totems. Does it relate to that in a way? I'm sure there's a similarity because the totem animal, uh, of course, is a representation of a force or idea, a spiritual force or idea, which is believed to exist independently. Uh, in the invisible, in that uh, the, sh- the, uh, the shaman or the individual practitioner, or the devotee taps into that somehow. So yes, there is a relationship there. Uh, however, it, the, the the closer example would be a clan, a clan, a totem in a clan, where you have that entire group or a uh, group of people focused around that particular totem animal. Right. Yeah. Because I know, as opposed to an individual. Yeah, Fro- when Freud was analyzing the ideas of totems, he saw them as uh, in in the uh, these different societies as a control mechanism as well to enforce uh, social norms. So uh, it kind of seems like the same kind of basic idea. Yes, except that the uh, we're adding in the fact that within the concept of the egregore, we have to always keep in mind the possibility, because we cannot prove this. I cannot prove this to your listeners. Uh, but the possibility that it's more than just a psychological construct, right. that there isn't right. a metaphysical construct, and that that metaphysical construct has very real uh, invisible hierarchy or entities on the other side that participate in that social control mechanism. There's a give and take. Do we create those entities? We don't create the entities. We can create thought forms. Okay, and thought and thought forms can become independent of us, but whether they become independent of us because they become self-aware, or because they're a projection of some aspect of our psyche that breaks off somehow in some way, tangentially, if you want to call that, or more likely simply because it's a really good thought form, and something moves into it to take up residence, just as you move into a really nice house to take up residence instead of a. Uh, you know, falling down shed if you can, you know, avoid it. Okay. Uh, so too, does that happen in the invisible? So our thought forms become, um, if they're well created, they become a potential vehicle for uh, indivis- invisible beings. Now, you have to mm-hmm. understand that's part and parcel of magical work. I don't understand what the problem is with people. They're not understanding that in the occult community. If you do any of the practices, you know, in in meditations with with deities, deity practices, you know, the statue or the uh, the image, the painting, the tanka, uh, that is used not just as a focal point, but you actually invite the deity to take a presence in it. You know, to, to yes. actually come there, and, and you know, it's not just for so-called meditation. Your visualization is actually the part of the the energizing the the vehicle. That the that the entity takes over. Yeah, you, temporarily. Yeah, you are bringing the entity into the, into that ritual. Right, yeah. and the, the thing is, it's in and through you. That's the other part that these folks don't seem to keep seeming to miss all the time. Mm. You know, modern magicians are, are have this this uh, terrible belief that somehow magic works independent of them, and it doesn't. It's in and through us all the time because our mind is the trigger. It's the initiator of the whole process. 
Yeah, we are part of the process. Mm-hmm. And probably the most important part. Well, without us, it wouldn't happen. Yeah. Because we, we initiate it. You talk about at the beginning of the book about uh, the Genesis 6, the Watchers. Mm-hmm. What's the connection there? Well, again, the notion is is that these Watchers um, watch over humanity. That's what Agrigores are. You know, that's what they do. They watch us. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of cosmic voyeurs. You know, they, they see what they like, and then maybe they come down and get involved in some fashion. Uh, what are they? I don't think... We really know. I think yeah. we have a pretty good idea. I think we've got some very good ideas. And I think as uh, John Keel said in Operation Trojan Horse, you know, his, his book about UFOs, he says, you know, we we pretty much know most of what these invisible beings are all about. We have thousands of years of folklore to tell us. We just have trouble understanding it. And it's these are the same things. These are the same entities, the same beings. You know, the question is, and I think the biggest problem with the notion of the egregore is, you know, is when we deal with, is the universe friendly? That's the underlying question people want to ask. And maybe it's neither friendly nor friendly, but indifferent. Well, just it the, has to be. In order. Yeah, just the biological yeah, nature. Yeah. Just the biological nature is both friendly and un. And very unfriendly as well. So why wouldn't it be on another level? That's and that's that's it. That's my point. And um, you know, I, I got in I got in a bit of trouble last year, year and a half ago, sometime when um, I wrote a, re- a reply to an article um, put out by Christian Bernard, who was the, the imperator of the Rosicrucian Order Amwork. And it was in uh, one of their, their digests, their their quarterly publication. And it was called Cosmic Politics. And it talked about these aspirations of the cosmos and all this kind of stuff. And I, I wrote a, a, a public response saying that this was nonsense. You know, that um, these ideals that he's writing about are, are human projections. They're not shared. They're not universal. Cosmic means universal. They're not universally shared. Okay. And that, um, you know, in the invisible, the only thing that matters is power. The invisible is hierarchical. It's not democratic. You you, you get a vote. (laughs) (laughs) You don't get to say, my my candidate didn't win. I want an impeachment. (laughs) Replace the Egregor. We want a new Egregor. I want a different one. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I, you know, I say it this way because you know, this is probably the twentieth interview I've done, and yeah. you know, it's I'm, I'm moderately fed up with the silliness of, <laughs> of so many in the occult community when it comes to their not only their politics but their understanding how these things work in in the real cosmos. <laughs> you know? Expecting it all to be nice, nice and white light friendly. Yeah, in a large section of it is. You know, large swath of it is. I mean, that's that's one of the things. You know, a lot of stuff I write about is about the nasty stuff that goes on and how we how we don't really discuss it openly. We don't really address it. But the reality is, there's a lot of good stuff out there too. We just have to recognize what are the real rules of the game. Not only what do we want them to be, but what are they for real? And in the in the invisible, you the average person just entering into that that. And lowest, we'll say the lower astral, if you will, for lack of a better term. So, you know, it's like walking in a in a major area, major urban area. You know, at three a.m. You know what you're going to run into. Uh, whereas, as you get more experience and more progress, then you know, you know what what is happening. You know the relationships you have. But the fundamental relationship is always about power because power in the invisible has with it de facto intelligence or what we would call wisdom. You know, it understands outcomes, cause and effect. It understands relationships. 
human beings don't understand that very often. They don't understand the, the effects of their actions or what the outcomes will be. They don't understand the, the, the relationship of hierarchy and power and authority. And let's say they're in the military or possibly in a religious order or something that's structured hierarchically, you know. So are, when you say hierarchy, what are we dealing with here? Is this like a hierarchy of, of angelic beings? I mean, what, what is that? Of all kinds. Okay. I mean, we, but it doesn't, you know, we have this very naive notion, and you see this particularly in, in modern paranormal research, particularly as affected the, these very ghost-busting shows that are on. <laughs> you know, I mean, the whole notion of the invisible is... <sighs> It's woefully human centric. Huh. That's what I like to tell people. It's woefully human centric. Even, uh, you know, for all the folks think about them, they really think of their metaphysics only in terms of humans. There's me, there's humans, maybe there's animals that I like and animals that I eat. But I don't really think much more about that. And then there's dead people, which of course are people, you know, and then me and my ancestors, because of course we got to do some ancestor worship now, because that's really hip. Yeah, but otherwise, which is another egregor, just another form of that, okay? And then, but of course, you know, don't pay any attention to family lineage, because that's, that's bad now, except if you're doing it in the right way, then it's good. So that's, again, a social control mechanism, an egregor. But then there's invisible beings. Oh, there's angels and demons. Okay. So maybe we'll throw in elementals for the fun of it. Mm -hmm. okay. But you see how woefully limited that is. These are just clusters of ideas that we use. These are just groupings, okay, uh, to try and understand relationships. So when we're dealing with the invisible, uh, we have to be very careful about what we encounter for the first time and the methods we use, because the methods are the filter that define our outcome of our experience. So you always want to do good things if you want to get angels. And if you don't care about that, you can get things a little rougher around the edges. Yeah. You could get something else. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to take it that you've had a ton of experiences with, with this from growing up in it and being in it your entire life. Um, what have you encountered something that is, that has been negative or indifferent? Oh, sure. All the time. Usually in the form of my neighbors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're, they're out there revving their engine at three in the morning. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for the guy with the motorcycle to leave now when we're recording, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it, it's, you know, but in the invisible, yes. But what happens is most people experience these things, but they don't know it. Uh-huh. Because we are in a sea of energy. We're in a sea of beings. We just don't recognize it at times. Even occultists don't recognize it well. So you have to, you know, create a profound generosity of goodwill towards all beings. It doesn't mean you're foolish or stupid about it, yeah. but you have to create a sense of goodwill. And, you know, that's very important to do. Uh, of late, I noticed in the last few years, you know, that notion of offerings and generating goodwill has, again, suddenly become hip. Uh, I like to brag now. We see, we, we talked about that 15, 20 years ago at the Institute for Medic Studies. You know, suddenly now it's, it's something they're talking about in the last few but it's it's important because um, you become like the people you are around. It's just that simple. That's why membership in a lodge or a circle or a group of any kind is extremely important. That you're very careful about who you let in. That you guard well the Western Gate. Because in doing so, you become like the five people you spend the most amount of time with. Now, let's amplify that and say the, those relationships are based around occult practices where those personalities and energies are amplified. All we need to do is, you know, look at the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn to see what happened there. Twelve years and boom, they exploded. 
you know, look at the lifespan of your average occult group. Yeah. And a lot of that has to do with what is the emotional energy we're putting into it? Where is that emotional energy going? Well, the collective awareness, the collective energy, you know, works through the, the leader of the group and also the individuals participating in it. But it also is a feeding mechanism for good or will of to whatever entities they have made contact with knowingly or unknowingly. That's why psychic hygiene is so important. Why really good banishings are so important. You know, why really good inner energy practices, like the middle pillar uh, or tumo, are so important. Because you need to make sure that all your psychic channels are made healthy and open and clear. Because, you know, we do pick up psychic parasites along the way, unknowingly. And many people across daily life encounter this, and they're worse off. They don't even know, like folks involved in emergency services, psychotherapists, all sorts of folks. Look, look at the folks who have the high, the professions that have the highest rate of suicide and substance abuse. You know? Yeah. That has a lot to do with the psychic environment they're in. Just being around negativity day in, day out, other people's negativity. Right, and not not knowing how yeah. to purge it, not knowing how to cleanse themselves. And there also could be some kind of entity that feeds on that negativity as well. Exactly. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> Which I think we talk a lot about that. That sometime on these shows, we'll talk a lot about these. Um, not just mine, but others. We'll talk a lot about that kind of like this negative aspect because that's kind of juicy, you know. But like the the positive stuff isn't as accentuated. That you do, you could have the you could have the opposite good effect if you accentuate and just your positivity in your life and who you surround yourself with. Well, exactly, and, and the the positive is nice. It's wonderful. It's harmonious. Yeah, it's not exciting for the most part, and people right. want excitement more. Right. And the problem is, is, you know, the people coming into this are, are not. I was just, you know, writing something earlier today for publication about this. The whole problem is we've taken what was once on the edges and pushed it into the main, of the, you know, the center square of the city. Uh huh. Okay. I mean, this was never, you know, part of day to day life. There may be worship aspects, but the kind of practices we're talking about were always kept on the margins, and and psychic hygiene was always essential. You know, when if you had certain encounters with certain beings or visions or even people, you know, you had to go through some kind of ritual purification. We don't do that. People don't even think they need to do psychotherapy before they do magic. Uh, so you, the, we've taken all of these things and you push them into the center square, the liminal, pretending that these boundaries don't exist. And, and that's why you have the chaos. I mean, there was a time when you couldn't study Kabbalah until you were 40. Well, that meant you were near dead. You had maybe 10 years left if you were lucky. <laughs> yeah. so that's because, well, but that meant you were stable. Right. So right. The, in, the, in, the destabilizing factor of the occult, the destabilizing factor of esotericism or esoteric practices, which are meant to be destabilizing in order to get to the root of your neuroses, do you understand? Okay, to get to the root of your ignorance, we have to destabilize you. Okay, so uh, those those things we we're not paying enough attention to. Uh, you know, people need good teachers; they need good guidance. That's hard to come by these days. But the, the, they also have to focus more on the positive, you know, on on what they really want out of it, and and that's where the egregore is is a factor, because. You know, all groups are not negative. And I, I try to make it very clear in the book in the end that all we're asking you to do when you when you read about this is to just sit back and take a, an assessment of, of your associations. You know, is this group good for me? If it is, fine, stay in it. If it's not, find a way to get out. And that involves any group. Yeah. I think I I, th I think that's good advice, and I also think that's excellent advice. What you said, because you know I I'm not an occultist, and I don't think any of these guys here with me are. A maybe bit. a little bit, <laughs> maybe Sir Fiel is a little bit, but 
it's it does seem like people just kind of jump into it and as you've pointed out i mean these are ancient traditions and the very few have engaged in them for uh, for centuries and now it's become very popular i guess again i guess because of the internet but people aren't maybe aren't prepared to jump into it as they as they used to be No, uh, they're not, and for a lot of reasons, some good, some not so good, but it's just the way it is, and it's what we deal with, and and that's why the book is written, and along with some of the others we've, we've put out at the Institute, is to help people understand what the foundational practices should be, mm-hmm. and what they need to do uh, to stay healthy in this, because what do they want? They want to be healthy. They want to be happy. That's what we all want. So if we want to be healthy and happy and we want these practices and this association with this group or this order or anything else, could be a political cause, right? Or it could be a social activity, okay? Or, or just a hobby club. Now, if we want to be healthy and happy through that activity, we have to pay attention to what our motives are and what the motives of the other people are. But most importantly, when dealing with philosophical and idealistic notions, and that's where egregores come in strongest, religion and politics, because they mm-hmm. hook onto your idealism. They hook onto your best intentions. Yes. And they feed off it. And that's what it is. They manipulate it and they abuse it. I and guess. sometimes they believe it, too, and sometimes they believe it, too. I mean, I, I don't know if when I read that essay by, by Christian Bernard, if he actually believed that. I'm sure he did. He wrote it. I have no reason to believe he didn't believe it. But it doesn't make it a good representation of the way the cosmos actually works. Just because you have good intentions and believe it doesn't make it true. But it makes it true in your point. actions. And because it makes it true in your actions... It makes it true in, 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 in it, it's like the, you know, it's like the idiot light on your car, you know, just what? because the idiot light doesn't work and you don't check your oil doesn't mean your engine's not going to burn up. I guess that would explain kind of this classic cycle of the most idealistic people and philosophies usually taking a dark turn. You know, I mean, like we talked before about, say, communism, you know, it starts all these super idealistic people thinking that they're going to be able to just change the whole world and everything's going to be so great. And then it takes, you know, this terribly dark turn and tens of millions of people dying later, you know, it's so, so these things latch on, you're saying to this idealism and then are they what's, what are responsible really for, for turning a lot of this idealism into uh, what becomes these dark forces? I wouldn't say they're responsible. I mean, humans have to take full responsibility for their actions. I mean, we look at the the current crisis in the Catholic Church. Oh yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm I'm in northeastern Pennsylvania. Oh yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I read that list as soon as it came out. I've I've met some of the people on that list. I was in meetings with some of them. Okay. Mm. So uh, not too many because a lot of them are dead. But there were names that I said, I remember them. Yeah, that was, yeah, okay. Mm. So the church and the individuals have to take full responsibility for their actions. But over centuries, just as or over days or weeks or whatever, depending on your group, uh, those influences can begin to multiply and accentuate until you lose control of the, you lose control of the car. Someone else is driving. And I think that's what we see inside a lot of large entities, a lot of large groups. The people come in, and they're just all happy and smiling. They get the rush of the experience, the Tony Robbins seminar effect, you know? <laughs> yeah. The, the, the tent revival effect. Okay? What and are then some... they go home, yeah. and, and that wears off, but where they still feel this devotion. But the fact of the matter is the people who they were dealing with, you know, maybe in their their group, you know, aren't as really sincere as they would like to believe them to be. 
where are some new places that you see like new egregores forming in say like I, I think of like the culture of the the tech elite, I guess what you'd call it now. It has very some very strange uh beginnings, occult like beginnings also. And you know, perhaps do you, where do you see new developments, new egregores maybe coming into being? Well, I think we have to look at two things. Actually, what is it genuinely new or what is just a migration? Okay. Well, we often... Okay. And they just take up shop somewhere else, a lot of them. However, you know, we can't genuinely produce new ones. And again, many of them are fine. You know, when we talk about an egregore, we're talking about a social control mechanism. So you could have a wonderful uh, collective notion of some uh, hermitage somewhere or some study group somewhere or even a nice business. A lot of businesses start out really dynamic and powerful and, and, and good. You know, they've got a lot of good ideas and they're good for their people. So you have those as well. And you have to emphasize that before we talk about, you know, just what, we're, what you're looking at is what we're really looking at is really the negative ones. Um, I think within that tech elite, the tech elite that we see primarily focused in Northern California, but elsewhere, appears, I have to say appears because I can't say for certain, to really be focusing on a lot of technologies uh, that are designed to create some form of continuity of consciousness or mechanical or uh, physical immortality usually in some associated with machinery of some kind, but also through, you know, biology as well. So these kind of, uh, um, crossovers between biology and technology is, is what they're looking at. So you see a lot of emphasis on that along with, uh, psychic development. You know, it's no surprise that a lot of the psychic research that was being done in the 60s, 70s and 80s was being done, you know, literally next door to a lot of the folks, doing uh, computer research and technology that would ultimately be in the internet. And they're talking to each other. You know, they knew each other. That doesn't necessarily mean it was conspiracy. It's just that they, you know, were at the place where the money was and where the brains were and where the lunch table was. Yeah. Uh, we, fl we flash forward to this time in place and we see uh, a conspiracy in the sense of the same way. These are the folks with the money. These are the folks with what they consider the brains and the great ideas. And these are the ones who they feel that uh, through their success uh, of whatever fashion that they should be guiding and directing the rest of humanity. This is nothing new. It's always been like this, except now they have a, an amount of technology and wealth that is, has never been known before. It's almost impossible to escape their grasp. As, you know, we talked about earlier before the show about, you know, the problems of technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I often jokingly point out to my my new age friends, they said, you know, when I look back and I look at all the predictions from the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, I look at all of them and I compare all the predictions of uh, new age utopia uh, to, uh, and there was, of course, some dystopia. There was a lot of earth changes stuff that people were big on that never happened, fortunately. But and then a lot of the, you know, the, the prophecies and predictions by the fundamentalist Christians, I said, they seem to have a better scorecard. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, we're we're closer to implants now and barcodes on our necks than we ever were. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But right. that comes again. That that's that's an egregor in itself. How does that notion take on a life of its own? Well, I was going to ask you about memes, about the whole concept of memes being a kind of an egregor. Yeah, they start out as an idea, as a thought form. Then as they get more and more people, you know, it's kind of like that uh, tulpa phenomena. Do they take on, do they become real? Do they take on a life of their own? You know, does the Slender Man actually exist because we got all these teenagers pouring their hormonal energy into it? Yeah. And, you know, there, there is that real possibility that the answer is yes on these things. Uh, the question is, for how long do they exist? You know, what's their lifespan? And everything needs to feed and what, every, what everything feeds off, whether we like to admit to it or not, is emotional energy. 
the energy of life, of purpose, of, ex- of, of sensation. So if you have uh, a meme that people are really getting emotionally involved behind, it's going to have a longer lifespan, for good or real, whatever the meme is. But most of them are like flies, you know, the mini flies. They're just going to pop on the scene and then boom, they're gone. Most people's thoughts are like soap bubbles. They don't really, fortunately, they don't really last that long or coalesce. Would uh, Slenderman be a good, perfect example of a meme or a egregore that would be come inhabited by something that is possibly real? Oh, sure. I mean, it's ideal for it. Yeah. <laughs> it really is ideal for it. It's a perfect generic suit of clothes. And you could definitely say that there's precursors to Slender Man kind of in a lot of folklore as well. Well, that's it. That's the yeah. point. It's it's so close to already existing ideas that it, it's very easy to pick up on. Yeah. There's no trouble identifying the, the notions of the, you know, the nasty guy in black or what have you, you know, and, and all that means. Uh, so, you know, we have to, you know, we have to be careful of our thoughts. What do we put our energy into? Mm-hmm. You know, as again, most people, their thoughts don't last long. They kind of just dissipate and they don't go anywhere. But that that's, that's unfortunate, too, because it means that they're not really that self-aware. Okay. Whereas the more self-aware you are and the more intention and the more effort and energy you have, the longer your thoughts exist. So, as the story said in Alexander David Neal's book, Magic and Mystery Tibet, you know, it, it's uh, just because we don't believe a tiger exists doesn't mean it won't eat us. And it's not only the tigers of our own thoughts we have to be careful of, but the tigers created by others. Mm. So, good psychic hygiene good spiritual practice, uh, positive thinking without being foolish. All of these things are de facto protection against it, protection against those negativities. I think popular culture is a big engine as well that can produce, because people will begin to see things that have been talked about only in popular culture. Or that, or those things well, will a, become manifest. Well, it's a new mythology. Yeah. And the problem is, if you look at Netflix, of course, and we saw who was the major financial donor uh, to specific campaigns over the last uh, two elections, what is his primary focus in terms of the direction of Netflix, creative you know, uh, content, uh, dystopia? Yeah, that's becoming more and more. <laughs> there is some new DC program on Netflix. They're like, there's a DC, uh, you know, they're going dark. It's always miserable. They, they they only did dark well once, and that was with Batman. You know, it only it was only worked once. <laughs> but it's, everything has to be dark and dismal. Yeah. And that that dystopian vision is extremely important to pay attention to because that's the vision they were trying to create in the collective mind. And I have no doubt that that is intentional. I have none whatsoever. What many people don't realize, and I have a pack of it here, I've, I've put pictures of it on the line for people to believe it, to see it. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, Zenith Radio Corporation and NBC Broadcasting, uh, and the BBC did this as well, but I only have the materials from NBC Zenith, uh, produced a series of cards for psychic research known as Venner cards. Okay? These were, these were used in conjunction with J.B. Ryan at the time, and they did a series of on-air telepathy experiments. And you would open up the cards. I have them, and they're inside as a sheet of paper. And it would tell you what stations were participating and what times and where to send your results. And they then produced a booklet. I have that as well. In which, and in fact, uh, J.B. Wright's daughter, Sally Featherman, she didn't even have the booklet. I sent her a copy of it probably 10 years ago. And uh, in which they talked about the results of this telepathy experiment. So as early as 
the 1930s when, when mass broadcasting was really just taking off. They were already experiments in psychic phenomena technology. And that needs to really be understood. Mass consciousness, basically. Yes. Yeah. Let's get into Lovecraft. Ooh, sure. Yeah. Uh, Let's. Per- Rob woke up, so <laughs> that perked his ears up. He's a huge Lovecraft fan. So you talk about Lovecraft in the book and about uh, him in the association with egregores. So what uh, what is that association? What, uh, what do you see? And you also talk about the guy who wrote Conan the Barbarian, which was very interesting. I knew absolutely nothing about that guy. Yeah, he was part of the Lovecraft circle. You know, we we're very fortunate. Lovecraft was uh, an extremely prolific writer and correspondent, so we know more about him because of his correspondence than probably any author ever, I've been told, because he's just so much of it, and we have it. Uh, what's interesting about Lovecraft is that, of course, he denied any interest in the occult. He denied that. He said he was a strict materialist, and yet he stated that the writings which he had were not inspirations. I mean, we would call that inspired. I'm sure there's a technical Latin or Greek word for that. You know, the, the opposite of fear. You know, but uh, uh, tra- traumatic dreams. You know, his nightmares. He told us that he was writing it down his nightmares. Okay. Now, of course, he denied that they were any anything of a other than a psychological nature. Nothing psychic to them. But that doesn't matter because we don't know. And doesn't mean he did either. And as we see later on, his work continues to inspire uh, a variety of occultists, particularly in the domain of chaos magic, but uh, other areas as well. And Kenneth Grant, uh, who is a peculiar fellow in his own way, uh, took an interest in fiction. And that question of where does fact and fiction blend? Where does, where does one become the other? which is always the question we're asking in any uh, psychic phenomenon or psychic or practice. And when does my imagination become real? That is objective. When does the subject become objective? That's really what we're asking. Okay. When does the objective become subjective? What is this relationship? So in Lovecraft, we're, we're looking at that on several levels. And, uh, I think that his uh, his work, because it has continued to be alive for so many decades, and is of such fascination to people involved in experimental aspects of uh, of demonology, essentially, uh, you have to wonder, you know, when does his ideas become a vehicle for something else? That's the question we're asking. Does any of that correspondence betray his uh, statements of not being um, an occultist? You know, I think that it simply doesn't matter because, as again, as John Keel pointed out, and as so many others have as well, uh, when people are used by these entities. You know, he can say all he wants. I don't believe, I don't believe, but it doesn't matter. I don't care. If 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 there is an and I'm saying if, you know, there's other forces using his creative and sensitive mind as a means of transmitting ideas and images into the collective psyche, they're unconcerned with his beliefs are. Right. Just because he didn't believe in it doesn't mean he wasn't involved in it. Right. Uh, that's really important to understand. It simply doesn't matter. People don't understand. You know, I I, I, I wrote a, an essay um, a year and a half ago, two years ago. It's on our blog. And uh, it was the first time I actually used a title that was going to be snappy and getty, you know, to, to grab people's attention. Normally I have much more polite titles and very formal. And this one was straightforward. It says, why angels can be douchebags. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, because you know, I wanted people to read it. You know, I said, okay, well, 
Angels are the ultimate control mechanism. They're the ultimate agenda. Um, you know, when we're, when we're dealing with these kinds of forces and entities, they have an agenda. And, and if you look historically, um, these invisible beings really don't care one iota for us. Yeah, that, that's really hard for folks to wrap their head around. That doesn't mean all of them are like that. But if we look at a lot of the people who've been involved in channeling messages from the other side in some fashion or another, okay, and I'm going to say that these people were legitimate, even even the ones that weren't legitimate, or saying like have nutters, okay, but maybe were involved in something that you could understand. But the ones who were actually involved, were sincere, were trying to help humanity and all this stuff, it's as if they, they're just, they're a little more than a meat suit. Yeah, so don't end. Look at Dee and Kelly. They're the perfect example. Not familiar with him. John Dee and Edward Kelly. John Dee and Edward Kelly. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah. that you're right. Yeah, that is a perfect example. The Enochian Angels. Yeah, they, they lied. Yeah. And, I mean, uh, uh, you know, the Indians, you know, they're great. Uh, there's a Tibetan phrase, I think, that I have in, in the beginning of the book. When the gods get desperate, they lie. You know? <laughs> you know? And, you know, the Indians, you know, the gods are scoundrels. Um, how do we begin to trust, you know, what we're getting from the invisible is the great question. You know, because it says, I think St. Paul said, you know, test the spirits. And we're constantly testing them. That There's a reason for that. Yeah. Make, to make sure that this actually, you know, has your, your, your best interest at heart. Going back to some of the stuff we're talking about with Lovecraft, um, in general, are creative types more susceptible to influence by otherworldly beings? Yeah, generally, yes. Yeah. Because they're more emotional. Okay. They're and less it, stable. Okay. So with, with Lovecraft, it, you know, his whole concept of the Cthulhu mythos, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rob, is the whole idea that these beings are extremely impartial. They don't care about man in any way. And that is a reflection of what you just talked about, what you just spoke about now, that a lot of these entities beings that they, they don't have any interest in humanity. So he, he reflects that idea. Sure. Hey, hey, what did you have for lunch today? Had Mexican food. Yeah, Mexican. Gra- was there ground beef in there? Yeah. Care about the cow? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> yeah. But again, is there a need, though? Was, it's like you're saying there's a, a parasitical need, though, for something we have. This this energy and this emotional energy, they, they need that? Is this, like their sustenance? Well, it's just like you need the cow. Yeah. So it's not total indifference, then. It's like a parasitical relationship. Right. Or or it's just, you know, it's what, what you know... And what have you done for me now? You know, what, what have you done for me yesterday or today? What have you done for me now? Um, and, and again, not all the beings are like that. No, quite a few of them aren't. That's the wonderful mystery of life and the mystery of the cosmos. But we have to understand that our thoughts are real. They have an effect on us when they combine with others of a similar thought or even an identical one, such as when branding, if you will, or doing magical work or uh, religious work or devotions or, or really focusing on uh, even your favorite sports team you know, or, or television show. You know, these energies and entities um, cr- create a, a reality or th- that uh, becomes a vehicle for other forces that correspond to the qualities that we're generating. Like attracts like. 
And in that regard, um, we don't really think much about other people on a day-to-day basis until we need something from them. Hmm. You know, for better or worse, you know, and, and this is why I said it's generating generosity and goodwill. I'm not an idiot compassion, a smart one, but goodwill and openness as best you can and, 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 and uh, thinking about what is my impact on others. That clears a field so that, you know, you don't become just indifferent to others to the, to the same degree that these uh, these beings are indifferent. Then you're more likely in their category. So you have to practice religious, and metaphysical, and spiritual idealistic devotions that have you know, the best as you can conceive of uh, the highest qualities of morals and ethics and character. And then, of course, you'll be attracted to those forces as well, and they to you. You're you're trying to get out of the natural state of the universe, which is a, kind of like a selfishness. I don't know if this universe is naturally selfish. I, I, I don't know that. There seems to be a balance to the universe. You know, it, it doesn't seem to ever get too terribly good or too terribly bad. You know, as soon as it gets really, really bad, and it's about to tip, yeah. it would go. Yeah. And then when it's really, really good, you know, something comes along. And we see that cyclic practice going over and over again in different philosophies. You know, the Western world, particularly the mono, you know, the influence of monotheism. You know, I think mostly Christianity and Islam here, but maybe Judaism as well, tend to look at things in a very linear fashion. You know, we're going in this trajectory upward, and there's an end point to history and all of that. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you look at, uh, say, some of the Asian philosophies, they tend to be more cyclic. You know, this is the age, this is the cycle. You know, it's happened before, and it's like they'll say in Tibetan Buddhism or, you know, in Indian philosophy as well. You know, in the the, the first age, you know, 90 or 95 percent of the people are involved in spiritual practice. And then, you know, so many in the second age, so many in the third age. And now we're in this age, the Kali Yuga, and maybe only 5 percent of the population is involved in spiritual practice. But it's the cycles. So that even even when you reach the golden age, even if in alchemy we get to restore the golden age, if we get a new Jerusalem, even that will eventually decay and fall. Whether it takes 2,000 years or 20,000 years, it will eventually decay as well. Because it's a duality. So I, I take it that you've studied a lot about Asian... Uh, religions then, like Tibetan Buddhism, you reference often in the book? I think because it's so popular in the West, you know, yeah. you have to you have to give people reference points that they can grasp, and uh, that's an important one because it is, at least at the moment, uh, is fairly big in the West. There are signs that it is uh, not declining, but it's not, not expanding at the rate that it did. Uh, for a variety of reasons, but it, it definitely has an influence on us. And, it, and really, Tibetan Buddhism, particularly the Vajrayana and the Dzogchen, is, is the survival of some of the oldest Asiatic shamanism that, that we know. So, you know, we put it in that context as well. Do you think that Tibetan Buddhism had that big of an impact on the West because perhaps there are... Um... Uh, yeah, as opposed to the more traditional Buddhisms, there there are these, I guess, spiritual uh, influences from uh, beings, whether you want to take them as literal beings or as kind of thought forms and things like that. Oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, I find I also find it amazing that uh, so many non-practicing Jews and non-practicing Catholics uh, leave their uh, fairly uh, strict and conservative religions, and then go to what is essentially an equally strict and conservative religion, which is Tibetan Buddhism, and, yeah. and then try and reinvent it in their 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 own preferred 
uh, political image. Uh, you know, Tibetan Buddhism, you know, is, has is very you know hierarchical, and and you know, traditionally speaking, and uh, has a lot of the same moral and ethical restrictions that you see in, in those religions. So I find that's an interesting that the, the gravitation is towards that. But the point is, what it does is it offers a personal practice that you don't see in uh, you know many of the mono, monotheistic faiths. The you know the levels of practice aren't there, or it's not as easily accessed. Right, and it it's personal. One does not get salvation in, in in Buddhism. One gets awakening or various degrees of enlightenment. And of course, Vajrayana is very exciting. You know, the tantra is very exciting. They engage the emotions. They utilize them. Okay, whereas. Um, You know, the, the Theravadan Buddhism is, it, I just find it frankly boring. You know, I mean, it's, it's just me. <laughs> that's and the more kind of, of traditionalist approach? The Theravada? Yeah, that's, you know, yeah. yeah, the more traditional. What we, that, that would be, that actually would be Buddhism, the more pure stream of Buddhism. Sure, okay. Yeah, tr- Tibetan Buddhism really is, I, I can make an argument, as can many, that there's, it's not a, it's, it's it's Buddhist, but not a lot. It's very syncretic. Yeah, that's correct. And that and that comes from the the the, the in pre-Buddhist bun, which means chant, or the you know magical practices and meditative practices uh, that were there and and across you know that part of uh, of, of Asia. But those are powerful, powerful egregores, too. Can you rid yourself of an egregore? Can you get out of Pretty it? Sure you just leave. Yeah, you leave it. I mean, Scientology, yeah. right? True. Leave Scientology. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, you can leave that. You can leave any egregore. <laughs> 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 yeah, well. really. Uh, but what happens is people, because of the social control mechanism, they've built their lives around these things. It's painful. They can't conceive of themselves existing without it. And if you just want to have an idea as to how powerful an influence things can have on you, you know, if, if you're a practitioner of, of some group or you belong to a group or anything or particular practice, just do this. Take all the stuff you have associated with it. Everything, all the pictures, statues, images, tchotchkes, maybe even the books if need be. Maybe those can cover over, but everything else, put it in a box and put it in your closet for a month. Which I guess is why you have like the the cultural Catholics or cultural Jews where they're not even really practicing, but their whole life just revolves around it. So they can't really. That's it. They can't really, they can't really separate. It's very, what, what, if I get rid of this, then what? Nature pours a vacuum, then what? What do I do? Then who am I? I guess people define themselves yeah. by it, so. Well, that's correct. It's a, an I am fill in the blank. You know, I am that. Even if I don't want to be that or don't like that, well, that's what I am. I am that. Because I, I'm not going to fill in the blank any other way. I don't know how. Or it's too much responsibility. It always kind of reminded me of these kind of like depersonalization things that they remind me of, of like the death instinct where people are, people are trying to be something else or trying to be an aesthetic or something else that's not them. It's like they're negating themselves as this independent being in favor of some larger thing or just images, or I guess it is like a egregore. They're, giving up their personal will and identity to something like that. Well, we have to learn, you know, we learn in stages. We learn and in, in, we take baby steps. And uh, that's why I'm, I'm not too terribly hard on, on the process. I'm just pointing out what happens and telling people to make a decision as best they can. You know, we all learn in baby steps uh, how to, how to do things. And that includes, you know, religion and philosophy and, in spirituality, and those things are deeply personal and deeply 
emotional. And then we want to act on that. We want to put those good ideas into motion. We want to be, you know, saving the world from itself. Uh, we want to bring, uh, you know, enlightenment to the, to the unwashed masses of, of Silicon Valley. Speaking of that, I know I touched on that, but is is there, I mean, is there any egregore now that you see as the most dangerous to us? I mean, is there, what, what you said, I guess, religion and politics are, are the main ones. Is there, is there one that's really, you think, is the main it, threat? Because it, it causes self-censorship. People, people are dishonest. They, they don't say what, uh, what they're thinking, uh. They're second guessing. It creates neurotic uh, tendencies in people. They're probably the most dangerous thing is political correctness. Yeah, I would say that because is a so dangerous egregore. Mm-hmm. It's so amorphous you can't quite pin it down. Mm-hmm. We always have and to constantly the, watch what we say. And all the and all the the the, the self indulgent narcissistic virtue signaling. I mean, yeah. the pride is, it's a satanic pride that it induces. We've been talking about this exact thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we're right there with you on that. You, everyone is, but yeah. they're so afraid to say it publicly. Right. Right. And they, they're terrified to say publicly what's going on. I mean, you know, I... I I got lectured because uh, for 20 minutes because I I used the word Indian on my on my my son's uh, school campus. You know, I explained to them. I said, "You understand uh, that the only people who use the word Native American are politicians and people with an agenda. If you go out to these territories, everybody uses the word Indian." <laughs> The Sergio, yeah. you would know something about that, right? Yeah, I can second that. That's yeah. true. Yeah, and and they, I said, so please don't don't lecture me on it. But you know, I went on. And I said, look, you know what we're talking about. But that's what happens. That becomes the 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 social control mechanism where it's not only do we seek to control others and in, in their speech and their thoughts, but we deny reality. We deny what's actually happening and create these bubbles. Again, a social control mechanism is a bubble, okay? These echo chambers. At some point, they collapse. When they collapse, it's terrible. That's the scary part. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's like like Rajneesh Puram, you know, the wonderful documentary on Netflix about that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, when when that collapsed, oh, oh, man. You know? And yet it survived. And yet it survived, and they're still doing seminars and workshops and <laughs> for big money. They're corporate training gigs. Yeah, but are they in as negative a place as they probably were at, in the 80s when things were just getting no. really bad, you know? No, I doubt it. But the fact that it even survived is stunning. I mean, that yeah. means that true believers had to be there. Right. True believers had to be there to keep the, the wheels turning and paying the bills and finding a way to 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 keep it alive. Yeah, Wild Wild Country. That's a well-recommended mm-hmm. documentary. <laughs> yeah. Well, Mark, thank you so much. I mean, this has been very enlightening. Um uh, well, I think we, we, we covered some interesting ground. Um, tell us people where they can get the book and uh, where they can see your other books, contact you, all that good stuff. Well, uh, Egregore is the occult entities that watch over human destiny, of course, is available directly from the publisher and your traditions. You can get it at your local bookstore. Uh, I encourage you to do that. And if uh, uh, trans, you know that necessity and transportation is an issue, there's a lot of online vendors, particularly Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Uh, through a variety of sites there, and of course the publisher. Um, uh, I can be contacted very easily at the Institute for Hermetic Studies. Uh, just Google us, it'll pop right up. It's hermeticinstitute.org. And of course, if you do go to Amazon, you will see a listing of about 30 books that uh, I've written or uh, been involved with writing with wow. for the Institute. So uh, there's a lot there. Uh, Alchemy, Kabbalah, 
Freemasonry, all those are in French, Spanish, Estonian, Polish, a lot of other languages. But we have our monographs and course material, of course, there as well. And just anyone can get it and use it and make their lives better with it. All right. Well, stay on the line for us, Mark. We're going to uh, close this section out, and we'll be back to close the show on Conspiranormal. I just bought a new base. I'm super excited. Yeah. During, during the break. That's the... Uh, the, the <laughs> Sorry. I wasn't going to talk about that, but I just can't hold it in. Rob is excited, so excited that he's bought a new base. <laughs> yes. I've never owned a new base. Give everyone the specs on it, Rob. It's yeah. a Schecter Stage 5 with a three-ply maple neck through construction, mahogany body, uh, string through bridge, ebony neck, Grover tuners. Active pickups and active EQ. It's going to be awesome. Sexy. He's going to make a new theme song. It's going to sound like <laughs> Seinfeld. Yeah, exactly. But do, 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 do. <laughs> yeah. So that's, I was really excited. This is the most like joyful I've seen him in like a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> well, you saw me like yesterday at my worst. So now today at my best is just such a contrast. Yeah. And we should talk about what happened. Rob's great adventure. <laughs> That I participated in as well. So, so I feel like I should preface this by saying I'm privileged enough to work the Titans games, a lot of the home games. Yes, uh, I do. Which back we had the first home game this last Sunday, and we won. It was yes, a good game. Yes, they won. A lot of occultism in that Titans logo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to bring it back around. And uh, so I was there. It's it's a really long day because you got to load in like hours before there's any pedestrian traffic and you gotta wait till like hours after everyone leaves to load out and stuff and it's it's a really long day but it's it's an easy day and it's fun you get to watch the game and stuff so i had my backpack with me which uh, you know i bring tools and i've got my work keys and i throw my car keys and other anything i don't want to carry around with me in there and so all the other guys all the other production people were there they all have backpacks too and there's so there's just backpacks everywhere we're and we got done with everything we're loading out and somehow a police officer that was working because they, the station police officers, you know, throughout the stadium thought that a fellow officer had left his backpack there. And so he grabbed it and took it. So we got the truck loaded and I, I went looking around and couldn't find my backpack. I would, you know, I got up at three o'clock in the morning and worked a 14 hour day and my brain was all frazzled. So I was like, maybe I set it down somewhere. I don't know what happened. We made a few calls and found out maybe it's in lost and found. Can't find out till the next day or whatever. So I got a ride home. My car was stranded on the other side of Nashville and you got a ride home. From the guy. From the guy who told the cop that it, that backpack didn't belong to anybody. Yes. He had to go, what, 15 miles out of his way to take he you did. home? He did. And he he felt really bad. And, you yeah. know, he did everything he could to help out. And I'm thankful for that. It sucked. But, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. So Adam the next day gave me a ride. We're going to go to the stadium and check the lost and found. But on the way there, I got a call, phone call from my boss who had got a phone call from a the police officer. uh was his name Lieutenant Rogers? I want to give him a shout out. He's a very nice fellow. Shout out to Lieutenant Rogers. He might uh, be listening because he, he, you know, he looked at my backpack and found a pay stub, so he called where I work and whatever. So instead of going there, we went to the police precinct. I got my backpack back. Adam drove me up to where my car was. Got my car back. Everything was all fine. I got to work a few hours late, and so it was all good. And I just thinking back on it, the, there's there's one thing that's that's really making me, me chuckle a lot is that I started playing Grand Theft Auto Five about two weeks ago. So I've I've been in the virtual world. I've been shooting cops and stealing cars and doing all this horrible stuff. And then in real life, the police stole my car accidentally. So like, that's true irony. I appreciate that. In a sense, yes, yes. Thank you, universe, once again. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, you got, we got pretty lucky on that one, considering that we we're on our way down to the. Yeah, it all worked out perfectly as, to the stadium, and then you got that call and. So we didn't actually have to go to the stadium and watch some asshole try to find your bag. And <laughs> right. Is this it? No. Oh, is this it, guys? Yeah. So it kind of sucks, but, you know, 
next time though hopefully they'll be more aware of people's stuff yeah well <laughs> next time i'll just wear the thing the whole time i'm there and <laughs> <laughs> get a bicycle yeah, and, chain and like and to point out like you're there for like it's a 14 hour day and you and basically for the artist to play two songs yeah yeah it's like seven minutes of actual show time who's the yeah. artist uh yesterday it was um Morgan Morgan Wallen, I think is his name. Okay. I should I should know that. Yeah. <laughs> we live artists. in Nashville. It's but, all it's all country artists, and I don't know much about that world. Me neither. We're so inundated here. We're just like if you actually live in Nashville, you know you know nothing about country. Yeah, that's how kind of how it works. Although I've I've, I've been trying lately. I've just I felt kind of bad about it. I got kind of self conscious because you know you meet people from outside and they're like, oh, you heard the new album. Well, you're in Nashville, and so yeah. I started listening. Occasionally, I started trying to listen to the Hot Country playlist on Spotify. <laughs> it's it's pretty entertaining. It's like totally hybrid, like with little beats in it and like EDM hooks and stuff. Oh yeah, like, it's, it's total pop. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Do you but, remember that uh, we when we were coming back from the Peter Hook show? I like Surfing the stuff. Do you remember the? Uber driver, that girl that was moved up here to go. Oh my god, yeah. She was all about um what is it, the big fat the CMA fest and all that. Yeah, fanfare. Uh, she just talked her ear off about it the entire time. Yeah, I like the oldies, but we get a little burnout on the yeah industry. But much love to it because it brings in a lot of a lot of money, a lot of people. So that's true. That's yeah, it's true. So uh thoughts on the interview. That was uh, that was interesting. It was Very, really interesting. It was, yeah, it, it's something I, I've thought a lot about, but I didn't realize that there was um, terms for a lot of that stuff, or like whole um, right. You know, ancient like old people have been t- talking about thinking about this kind of stuff for a long time. You know, just the idea of um, you know, talk a lot about uh, collective consciousness or the power of thought, the power of belief. You know, that increasing in groups and um, manifesting things in the world through through that stuff. Um, I don't know. It's just something I've really spent a lot of time thinking about, and and no time whatsoever researching. So it was like really cool to. Yeah, I'd never I never had heard the term before, but when you think about it, it's a uh, you know the I, I've, the the concept of a thought form or a topa I have heard, which that's a whole other thing that we could do about that. Um, that whole concept. I remember like we talked to, um, remember we talked to Jenny Ashford about the Phil, the Philip experiment and she mm. had never heard about the, uh, about the term Tulpa. Right. Um, you know, so it's not something that's, that's, that's very well known, but it's kind of starting to come into a lot of popular consciousness. Right. And I, and another thing I never <laughs> thought about was the, the tie in with, um, for some reason, the, uh, governments and religions. Yeah. Which is, makes a lot of sense in, uh, uh, Sydney, one of my daughters is, is reading Lord of the F- Flies right now for school. Oh, I've never read that. Have you, did you read that? Yeah. Okay. But yeah. Uh, it deals a lot with how, um, you know, the old saying, if you get three people together, you've got a government. It'll kind of, a hierarchy will form. Yeah. And there's this uh, strange power and just energy to it. And it's kind of a lot along the same things what he was talking about. You know, well, there was that. Remember, you talked, we talked about, um, we talked about this on the show, but I think it's worth reviewing is that there's this concept of where you can identify with your family and you need broader <clears throat> concepts to identify with a, with a nation yeah, or a I, larger I group as a whole. Yeah, I can't remember what that number was called. Um, but there was somebody who theorized that, um, basically you can, you can judge the size of a primate's, um, clan size by the size of a certain area of their brain mm-hmm. because it, it's like a, a, a like a sorting or like a filing area for people that are in your clan and the larger that part of your brain is the bigger the more uh individual people you're capable of feeling empathy towards and god i wish i could remember the name of it because it's a really cool concept but um you can fill one of those slots with like an emblem instead of a person mm. so you know, say, according to his theory, the the maximum number that most people can empathize with is about 180 people. So outside of that, you, 
you know, you can hear about these tragedies across seas where 2,000 people die, and you just say, oh, that, that, that um, sucks, you know. But, you know, if your dog passed away, you're broken down for weeks because you're just physically incapable of feeling empathy for more than a certain number of people. But you can use those card slots for, for other things. Like, say, um, I was in the... Maybe I was in Cub Scouts, so I just I naturally feel more empathy towards anyone that's in Cub Scouts, and that's that's one of my placeholder kind of slots, or like a flag, or um, a religious ideal, or something like that. They can they can take the placeholder for one of those individual slots, and that kind of gives you a broader range of uh, just empathy. Yeah, that's pretty. It's pretty fascinating. Um... I'm kind of at a place where I don't, I'm not really, sh I'm not a, I've never been a strict materialist, um, but I'm not really sure what I think about these ideas of, uh, I guess, lower entities um, of this, you know, really like haunted universe with these hierarchies of, of different kinds of beings and entities. I'm, I'm not really sure. I mean, I, I think that, I see a lot of what appears to be influences from things like that in history and, and culture and art. And I don't, I don't really know what I think about it. I'm still kind of up in the air if I'd take it literally or not. I don't know. Um, as far I've as felt being, strange things before, but you mean as, as far as like the, the entities being sort of sentient. Yeah. As yeah. far as these not being some kind of projections or, yeah. psychological phenomenon yeah um, and when when i read the book i thought that was kind of what he was getting at um as i think some of this with this with this book i think he's writing he's writing this for occultists yeah for them to to understand it so if yeah. you're not an occultist you may not understand it as well um but so I thought what he was getting at was I thought he was getting at that we actually are creating these entities. But in it's other more words, like, we're uh, we're creating. Um, we've we've created uh, almost like we've created God in a way, right. you know, because because of our mass but consciousness that vehicles. makes God real. But he what he's saying is you're creating a concept that can be, can be inhabited by an entity. Right. Um, I think it's worth it. We'll look, we'll look, I'm going to look a little bit at the history of, of an egregore. Uh, this is from the book of knowledge from Wikipedia. So the first author to adopt, to adapt egregore in a modern language seems to be the French poet, Victor Hugo in the legend of the ages in 1859, where he uses the word egregore first as an adjective, then as a noun, while leaving the meaning obscure. The author seems to have needed a word rhyming with words ending in the sound R. It would not be the only example of word creation by Victor Hugo. However, the word is the normal firm that the Greek word, I am not even can't even read that, watcher would take in French. That was the term used in the book of Enoch for great angel-like spirits. Which so an egregore yeah. in that case could be, could mean an actual spiritual entity, and it also can mean the vessel that it inhabits that is created by us. Right. Um, Alephus Levy in Le Grand Arcan, The Great Mystery, 1868, identifies egregores with the tradition concerning the Watchers, the fathers of the Nephilim, describing them as terrible beings that crush us without pity because they are unaware of our existence, which that's very similar to all of Lovecraft's mm -hmm. Cthulhu mythos. And what what is he called? The Old Ones, Rob? Is that what um, he calls them? <clears throat> Yeah, depending on on um, there's several different different ones. The the Cthulhu stuff, I think it's the old ones, but there's also like the the ancient ones or some of the weird squid like creatures. And there's I can't remember what, which uh, which ones are which, but yeah, yeah, with the Cthulhu stuff, the the giant um, like basically cosmic beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've just kind of always been around and lurking and. 
and don't care. <laughs> yeah, they're just not involved <laughs> in one way or another. <laughs> the, but they'll, but they can drive you mad if you look at them. Yeah. So, the concept of the Egregore as a group thought form was developed in works of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and the Rosicrucians, and has been references referenced by writers such as Valentin Tomberg, notably in his anonymously penned book Meditations on the Tarot. And Mark does talk about Valentin Tomberg in there. He was a Christian Kabbalist, an Estonian, and an anthropophysist, which was an offshoot of theosophy. Very interesting. I want to kind of dig into more of his thoughts and his ideas of who I he was. I believe that was in the whole... Estonian Russian Christian mystic. So there you go, Russia again. No. Feel. It always goes back to Russia. Enough, enough of that for now. But yeah, it was really interesting, and I'm not a. I'm, I'm open to the idea, but honestly, that's something philosophically that I've always kind of struggled with. You know, whether I think there really is the you know all these types of yeah entities, but that also goes to you know I'm not really sure what I think about the spirit world, the nature of the soul, and everything else. So. I, I, I I'm religiously agnostic about it. To me, I, I believe that there that there's definitely entities. Um I think there's the good, there's the evil, and there's also probably the neutral. I appreciated how and it's you know, it definitely shows as hermeticism. Um if you take, you know, as above, so below mm-hmm. uh literally, then you know, just like in nature, there's indifference, there's darkness, there's uh, uh, mean parts to the world. Why wouldn't there be in the spiritual realm? Why would the spiritual realm just be this? Right. Oh, great, happy-go-lucky place, and everything's all one, and blah blah blah. You know, if <clears throat> love if, and light, man. Yeah. If there if there is a spiritual world, then I don't see why it it, it wouldn't be the same. I yeah. I agree with that to a degree, but at the same time, I don't really believe in good and evil. I believe in right and wrong from like an ethical standpoint, but that's perspective based. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're, we don't, you know, take take like I, I have a lot of friends that are uh, vegetarians or vegans. You know, they're doing what they think is right or wrong. I don't think that that makes them any more good or any less good or me any more evil or good. It's just it's kind of a it's a very debatable issue. You know, if you're a, if you're some kind of spiritual being that's outside of the physical world. What does that even mean? Right. I, you know. And he kind of expressed that too. And like some of it is just total indifference. Right. You know, if they're feeding off of us because they need energy, they're not going to really give a crap as long as we're here. It's like us not wanting to destroy the planet because we need it. You know, we can't, can't burn down all the rainforest because we need oxygen. Like <laughs> Well, and, and with the ties into Buddhism and stuff, it makes me think about how, you know, the goal of Buddhism is to basically go backwards from incarnation and that incarnation itself and the creation of this karma and the creation of thought forms, um, you know, like these things, if they're this advanced, then I could see from a Buddhist perspective, they would be inherently negative because they're like this, these, this collected energy that just keeps on feeding on other stuff and just keeps on going. So I don't know. It's, it's interesting though. To further your point about the above, as above, so below, about uh, spiritual entities being good, evil, neutral. Uh, the Islamic concept of the jinn, yeah. that's what they believe, is that they're good jinn and they're a bad jinn, and then they're also jinn that just don't care. Right. And just like with the they're influence just like of people. older stuff in Tibetan Buddhism, that was the influence of older traditions in the Middle East and Persia yeah. being incorporated into Islam. I don't know too much about Tibetan Buddhism. It's... Like he said, I mean, it's got all this ancient shamanism in it. It has um, a lot of deities that were pre-Buddhist. So it's just this big kind of complex and critic uh, world that isn't 
that's really glorified because of the Dalai Lama and because of the you know the downtrodden you know nature of the political situation. But uh, yeah, it's real complex. Yeah. Uh, we were going to talk about the Active Measures documentary tonight, but I want to wait still because I do want you guys to see it. Because Putin called him and told him not to. Yeah, well, I started getting <laughs> all those, uh, the Bernie Taylor uh, YouTube channel. Bots. I started getting all those Russian bots. Like, we like seriously. Like, well, they uh, look like some hot chicks, dude. You should I know, man. Yeah. That, that, well, you, uh, first of all, that, that, that uh, video on YouTube got... 1300 views. I don't know where that came from. Most of our videos, like our top one, I think was like around 300. That was the 200th episode where we had Randall in here. So that's probably why we got so many, but, uh, usually that's now that's the top one. And then all of a sudden I kept getting these comments for everybody's name was all on Cyrillic. And it kept saying like, awesome, great show, really good stuff like that. So I don't know what the deal is with that. <laughs> so maybe the Russians are, are aware of us, but yeah, I want to wait. I want you guys to see the film. Um, uh, it's on Hulu. I know that. So I just want yeah, to let you get tell, your, you tell guys Olga thoughts slide about in it. that DM man. say, what's up? I like Russian girls. Yeah. We can get on the, on the website. You know, there's plenty of websites <laughs> out there, man. <laughs> Cause paranormal dot. Are you, so we we will talk. Hopefully next time uh, we will talk about that uh, once you guys have had a chance to kind of sit down and watch it. Um, so I think that's pretty much it. I don't really have anything else to add. Uh, Rob, tell everybody where they can find us and uh, find Patreon. And by the way, um, we before you do that, we did get another Patreon. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, $10 Patreon. Yes. And that person is Jeff. So thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, you make this all happen. Shout out. So I think we, we may be around about $100 in Patreon a month, which does pay for the show and does pay for the web hosting for the website. So thank you so much. Uh, so if people want to give us some more money, where can they find our Patreon? Yeah, if you want to, if you want to help us with the show, help us improve the show. Um, you know, it costs us a lot of time and money to do this, and we do it out of the kindness of our hearts. But you know, it it does help. Um, you can go to patreoncom slash normal. There's different tiers you can subscribe to. There's uh, we've got wallpapers up there. We've still got some T-shirts. We're going to order some new T-shirts when we run out. And there's all the we got what around ten bonus episodes now. I think it's probably more than that. And more more on yeah. the way. You know, we have a lot of guests hang out with us afterwards, and, and we release that stuff just to, to, to you uh, patrons. And if, if you don't want to subscribe, uh, but you still want to contribute or donate just a one-time thing, you can do that through our website at conspiranormal.com. And if you want to help support the show, but you don't want to spend any money doing it, I totally understand. The best way to do that is a five-star review on either iTunes or Stitcher, or just tell your friends about us. Yes. So I believe that's it. Uh, thank you, Rob. It's good to have you back. It's good to be back. We, we love you, and we we want you to to be here. Summer is over, yes. so um, things should be calming down in, in yes. my crazy world. The crazy world of Rob. Because <laughs> <laughs> because Surfiel, he's he's done a really good job. He does. Uh, I yeah. I, I keep. I, I want to say that every time. Like. I'm so grateful that you guys can do this when I'm not around because I've been so busy and it always does. It sounds great when, when Surfiel handles it. So, Not that it does it when you do, Rob. But it sounds better here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because we got the full-fledged studio. So, All right, guys. Uh, next time, we're going to have Peter Robbins return, uh, this time for real. And we're going to talk about the first secretary of defense, James Forrestal, and the connection to UFOs. And I have some other interesting theories about him to throw at Peter as well. So, and then after that, uh, Jeannie Ashford is going to return to talk about her new book, The Faceless Villain 2. Yay. Which is everything, all the horrible murders from 1960 to 1980 that you yeah, could that's possibly gonna be fun. want. All right. So uh, join us next time, guys. On Conspiranormal! Conspiranormal.
needs a new bass.